This is The Guardian. This episode contains descriptions of conflict and violence that some listeners may find distressing. For more than a year now, I've been covering a defamation case like no other Australia has ever seen. The case brought by Ben Robert Smith against three newspapers that published articles Robert Smith says falsely accuse him of committing war crimes. This case has raised uncomfortable, excoriating questions about the reputation and actions of Australia's most elite soldiers in Afghanistan. Did the SAS lawfully and honourably prosecute their duty, forced to take difficult decisions during a long, gruelling and unpredictable war? Or was a culture of impunity, of violence and of retribution allowed to fester unchecked within the regiment? This trial has cast doubt on the scope of press freedom in this country. Did three Australian newspapers reveal shocking truths about what soldiers and governments did in our name and with our money? Or did they defame the man at the centre of it all, Australia's most decorated living soldier, who claims he has been attacked by a group of jealous comrades seeking to tarnish his reputation? On the first day of the trial, as I stood outside the federal court building in Sydney, Ben Robert Smith appeared alone, striding purposefully towards the court building. Not quite a march, but he had his head up and was smiling, pointedly ignoring the questions being thrown at him by the waiting television journalists. As the cameras flashed and Robert Smith made his way through the tight knot of people at the court's entrance, the former soldier let his guard down just for a moment replying thanks mate Thank you, to a well-wisher who called out a message of support before he strode up the steps and disappeared into the court. I'm Ben Doherty and from Guardian Australia this is Ben Robert Smith versus the media. is a podcast about a court proceeding, so I have to be extremely careful about what I tell you and how I present this information. The rules around court reporting in Australia are strict for any trial, not least for one with extreme national security implications. My obligation as a journalist is to report fairly and accurately, and as much as possible, you'll hear what I heard in court. Everyone you hear from this point on will be voiced by actors reading from court transcripts edited in some respects for time and ease of listening, but that remain an accurate representation of those sections of the trial. Silence. All stand. Federal Court of Australia is now in session. Please be seated. Inside the Federal Court, the noise fades away. There are no cameras, no recorders here. And the trial begins. In its quiet formality, Court 18D, where much of this trial is playing out, is like any other in Sydney's Federal Court building. But this case, this unwieldy, sprawling, extraordinary case has gotten so big, the rest of the building has had to transform to accommodate what's about to unfold. Entire floors have been sealed off, windows blacked out to prevent spying from outside, phones and smartwatches are banned from some court sessions, and alternative entrances and exits used to bring anonymised witnesses into the building unseen. All of this to protect Australia's military secrets and national security. On the left-hand side of the bar table sits Bruce McClintock SC. He's a huge presence in the courtroom, bellicose, belligerent, living up to his reputation as one of Australia's best-known defamation lawyers. Your Honour, this is a case about courage, devotion to duty, self-sacrifice and perhaps most important of all, surpassing skill in soldiering. On the one hand, that is on our side of the case. On the other hand, Your Honour, it's a case about dishonest journalism, corrosive jealousy, cowardice and lies. At its most fundamental, the case that Robert Smith and his lawyers are seeking to build, and the case that McClintock outlines in his opening statement, is that Robert Smith, an exceptional, highly decorated soldier who valiantly served his country with distinction, has been unfairly targeted by a group of envious comrades, 
poisoned by their own corrosive jealousy and determined to destroy his reputation. And they were aided in that mission by credulous journalists who were naive to the realities of war. The simple fact is that some who've reported on matters concerning my client have forgotten that fact, the violence of war in their rush to tear him down. On the right-hand side of the bar table sits the legal team for the publishers of the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age and The Canberra Times. Their lead barrister, Nicholas Owens SC, is a generation younger than McClintock, studious and unfailingly polite in court. He's highly regarded, but this is his first defamation case. Owens is the gentleman inquisitor, stepping forensically, almost surgically, through the defence case. We say that once Your Honour weighs the totality of the evidence, we will succeed in demonstrating that our truth defence is sound. The newspapers will attempt to convince the court that what they published about Ben Robert Smith was substantially true, that he broke the moral and legal rules of military engagement and committed war crimes, including being complicit in six murders of defenceless Afghan detainees. And under the Geneva Conventions, once a person has been placed under control, no matter that he may be without a shadow of a doubt the most brutal, vile member of the Taliban imaginable, an Australian soldier cannot kill him. To do so is murder. It's not until the fourth day of this trial that the first witness is called. Yes, could you come forward, please? I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Mr Robert Smith, would you state your full name? Benjamin Robert Smith. A decade out of the military, Robert Smith looks still every inch the archetypal soldier. Just shy of two metres tall, straight-backed and powerfully built, he sits confidently in the witness box, clean-shaven and hair immaculately swept. He wears a tailored suit, blue tie and white shirt. How old are you, Mr Robert Smith? 42. Robert Smith enlisted in the Australian Army, a storied family tradition. He's following in the footsteps of his father and the footsteps of almost every other male member of his family. When did you join the Army? I joined the Army in 1996. Straight from school? I completed school in 1995 and was held over because of an injury till 96. And after that, the elite Special Air Service Regiment, the SAS. I've always been fascinated with the military because of my family history. Robert Smith has three ancestors who landed on the beaches at Gallipoli. And so I learned from a very young age the value of service and that there is, in fact, something much greater than ourselves in relation to the freedom of a country. As Robert Smith sits in the witness box, you get the sense of a man used to battle, someone comfortable with conflict. He's here ready to defend his reputation. He speaks clearly, calmly. There are no extra words in his answers but there's an edge to his voice. I was sent to Afghanistan at the government's behest to be part of the Australian military. I did everything that I was supposed to do and I followed the rules. I did the right thing. I saw things in Afghanistan and did things in Afghanistan, like having to engage adolescents that I'm not proud of. And I live with that. McClintock, who is questioning Robert Smith, begins to paint a picture of his client, a picture of a good man from a good background, who would go on to do great things. And now, while you're in the army, or as a result of your army service, you receive the following decorations. First, the Australian Act of Service Medal with the following clasps. East Timor, that's correct, isn't it? Yes. The International Coalition Against Terrorism clasp? Yes. And you receive the Afghanistan Medal? Yes. Robert Smith went on six tours of Afghanistan with the SAS between 2006 and 2012. It was his actions during these tours that would make Ben Robert Smith Australia's most decorated living soldier. And in addition, you received the Medal of Gallantry for the action in Chora in 2006, didn't you? I did. You received the Victoria Cross for the action at Tizak in 2010. That's correct. Yes. The Battle of Tizak is revered within the SAS and the Australian military as one of its most extraordinary victories. Mr Robert Smith, try and remember you were in a courtroom in 2021, not in Tizak in 2010. I know that may be hard as you say what happened. 
We had four Black Hawk helicopters to carry the assault force, which is the SAS soldiers. And we had two Apache helicopters, which are gunships. On the 11th of June, 2010, Ben Robert Smith, second in command of an SAS patrol, is given a mission in the Valley of Tizak. Seek out and kill Taliban insurgents who are operating out of an enemy stronghold deep in the valley. Once we flew into the valley, it became evident that Tizak wasn't really like a valley we had operated in that much before. Tizak lies in a narrow, verdant valley. There are steep hills on either side, and in the middle, a dense canopy of fig trees covers the valley floor. We landed at 8 o'clock in the morning in broad daylight. As Robert Smith's helicopter descends into the valley, he and his patrol are in full view of the enemy. So that put those boys at a lot of risk. An enemy which was waiting and ready. An ambush is the best way to put it. It was basically as if every high point on either side of the valley erupted in machine gun fire. There are machine gun nests and insurgents carrying on their shoulders rocket-propelled grenades or RPGs. These are surface-to-air missiles and they're designed to bring down enemy aircraft. The men stand stationed at the top of the steep valley walls. My helicopter started to round a mountain at the top end of Tizak, the northern end. We were hit with machine gun rounds and an RPG just missed underneath our air front. As they land on the valley floor, the patrol is still taking fire. It seems endless. So, getting off the helicopter, we were taking a lot of machine gun fire and went to ground basically just there just trying to get under any cover we could. But the soldiers move forward still, pushing on with the mission to take control of the valley, to kill the enemy insurgents in their path. So all we had to go off at that point was the fact that you could hear the machine gun. I kept moving towards the sound of the gun, but then the gun stopped. Now, we don't know where the machine gun is because you can't see it, and now you can't hear it either. You've got to keep moving forward because we've got to continue the assault. And it becomes very eerie when you're walking through a fig orchard with the shadows and the trees perfectly aligned, just waiting to get hit. And then eventually, we did get hit. And we got hit hard. They knew that either we were going to die or they were going to die. And they were there to fight because they didn't surrender. As soon as we became visible to that machine gun position, They hit us with everything they had. You couldn't see it. The insurgents are so well hidden, scattered across the dense valley, that the loud cracks and flashing lights erupting from their weapons is the only clear sign of the size of the enemy that awaits the Australian soldiers. You can just see the muzzle flashes. So it became a combination of, sort of, trying to bound a couple of metres forward and, or just crawl. And I think around, you know, the 40, 30 metre mark, we were just leopard crawling. And that means that you are lying on your stomach and you pull yourself forward on your elbows because you need to stay as close to the ground as possible to keep your profile down so you don't get hit. So as soon as you stop crawling, you start firing to cover the man next to you who will crawl next to you. Eventually, the enemy fire becomes so dense, so constant. We literally couldn't move forward anymore. We were just trying to find the best cover. At that point, I observed a building over to our right side. The building on the right side was a small rundown mud brick outhouse, for lack of a better word. From their position, lying on the valley floor, doing everything they can to avoid enemy fire, Robert Smith notices a large window in the building closest to him and to his patrol. If someone had a fire, a burst of fire, out that window, it could have just killed all three of us. So Robert Smith springs into action and he runs up to the window. And I held my rifle up through the window and started to clear the inside of the building from the outside. He scans the inside of the building, making sure it's clear of Taliban insurgents. And his two SAS comrades, still pinned to the dirt of the fig orchard, are not in the line of fire. As Robert Smith is standing in the mouth of the window, an insurgent carrying a rocket-propelled grenade approaches from the other side. At some point, an insurgent grenadier with an RPG on his shoulder started to protrude the weapon through the window. Robert Smith quickly, efficiently, 
kills him. Obviously, it happened very quickly, and I had to engage the insurgent. But bullets from enemy machine guns are still raking the ground centimetres from his troop. Because the soil in the fig orchard was that dark, moist sort of fertile soil that you would expect. He watches one comrade get practically buried underneath the dirt. It was like someone had picked up a shovel and was just throwing the dark earth over the top of him because it's, I mean, there was just that many rounds impacting in the dirt around his head and you could see inside, you know, a, a 30 centimetre circle around his head. There was rounds landing. At that point, it was pretty evident that, you know, if, if we didn't do something, someone was going to get hit. Robert Smith says he was faced with a choice. The decision was, could you go home and face their families if you didn't do anything and they were to get injured or killed or do you go and potentially get injured or killed yourself? And as I have said previously, I've always tried to serve my country with honour and the decision that I made was that I, I could die knowing that I've done the right thing by them and their families and my family could live without me knowing that I still had my honour. I saw an opportunity to move forward and I ran up towards the wall. I got to the wall and engaged the first machine gunner and he went down. And then I proceeded to move through the gap in the wall and engaged the second machine gunner who was further along the wall and he went down. The second machine gunner was, at best, 15 years old. For the briefest of moments, Robert Smith and his comrades are no longer taking enemy fire, but the gunfight isn't over. Throughout the valley, the rest of the coalition soldiers are fighting an enemy which seems to fill up the hills. Typically, you would try and wait and consolidate. However, in this instance, it had taken us so long to break into the enemy position I felt we needed to continue to push the advantage. I gave the two men with me quick battle orders and decided that we would push the advantage and move across the courtyard and assault the building while we had the advantage. The idea was from that point to then fight house to house down the valley and that is what we did. From sunup to sundown, Robert Smith and his team moved through the valley, seizing weapons and steadily resting control of the enemy stronghold. The firefight rages all day. The Australians report killing 76 insurgents. They lose no one. Effectively, it was another sort of nine hours of fighting to get through all the buildings down at the end of Tizak. So 14 hours, probably. Around first shots to last shots. We didn't end up being able to get helicopters to lift us out until until dark. Listening to Ben Robert Smith recall the Battle of Tizak is extraordinary. When he gives this testimony, he's animated, he's engaged, he goes into fine detail, the kind of detail we don't hear in any of his other evidence. He draws out the day and paints a picture of his actions, the actions that lead to him winning the VC. At the time, it was effectively another day of many, but would come to become very poignant. The Victoria Cross is the highest honour an Australian soldier can be awarded. Given to persons who display the most conspicuous gallantry, a daring or preeminent act of valour or self-sacrifice, or extreme devotion to duty in the presence of the enemy. Of the thousands of soldiers Australia sent to Afghanistan, only four would receive this decoration. And what did the award of the Victoria Cross mean to you? It's interesting because the... Well, people obviously ask you that all the time, and I would say that, of course, I'm proud of it. I've had such a respect for the institution of the Victoria Cross. But I'm nowhere near as proud of that as I am to be able to count myself amongst that number of men on that day in that battle, because everybody fought with bravery. Everybody fought with gallantry, and most people, at some point, were fighting for their lives. And as I've said and maintained and will maintain until the day I die... That Victoria Cross is for what we achieved, because you cannot go into a battle alone. You simply can't do it. You have to do it together. 
That's what it means. McClintock spends hours, almost a full day, pulling us away from the courtroom and putting us in the boots of the man on the stand, reminding those in court that Robert Smith was a brave soldier who fought for his country without question. But the Battle of Tizak and Robert Smith's Victoria Cross are not at issue in this trial. Defamation is all about reputation, and McClintock here is reminding the court of what Robert Smith has to lose. After the Victoria Cross, did attitudes towards you, or did you observe a change in attitude towards you? Absolutely. It put a target on my back. In 2018, a series of stories from the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age and the Canberra Times contained allegations of abhorrent war crimes that called into question the behaviour of Australia's most decorated living soldier. On the weekend of 9 June 2018, the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age's front page ran a glaring headline, The SAS's Day of Shame. Inside, over four pages, the paper laid out the story of Ali Jan a shepherd and father in his late 30s from a village in southern Afghanistan, whom in September 2012 had travelled to a neighbouring village, a village called Darwan, to mill flour. The papers alleged that an Australian Special Forces soldier took a handcuffed Ali Jan and kicked him off a cliff before ordering another soldier to shoot him dead. The soldiers then allegedly presented Ali Jan's death as a legitimate battlefield engagement. The paper gave the soldier responsible a pseudonym. They called him Leonidas, after the Spartan warrior. When you read the articles, what did you feel? I felt betrayed and humiliated. And I say humiliated because everything that I had ever cared about was serving my country with distinction and honour and my friends and my unit. And in the space of a couple of articles, it felt like that was being taken away from us. Leonidas had deployed repeatedly to Afghanistan and formed impeccable connections up the chain of command, the article said. They described a warrior culture embraced by some special forces troops but loathed by others. It involved tattoos and a devotion to the Hollywood movie 300, which glorifies the fighting prowess of the ancient Spartans and whose climactic moment involves an enemy soldier being kicked off a precipice. Did you have any doubt that you were the person referred to as Leonidas in these articles? No. They make a significant point about the size of the individual throughout the article and his stature, and that he also had links to senior leadership of the military, which, obviously, being a soldier, would only come if you had a Victoria Cross, for example. Leonidas, the man we now know as Robert Smith, is implicated again in a second article the following day alleging he machine-gunned an Afghan man with a prosthetic leg to death and that that prosthetic leg was later souvenired and used as a drinking vessel. The article also contains allegations of what's referred to as a blooding, where an SAS soldier on his first deployment to Afghanistan was allegedly pressured by two higher-ranking soldiers to execute an elderly, unarmed Afghan detainee. It was just like a nightmare. I, it just kept coming more and more. It just... Anything, any objection we had had to it, to those journalists, was just ignored. And I was, as I've said before, I I was in shock. But I was also just so disappointed with, with what was happening. That weekend, Robert Smith says, people kept calling him. And what sort of things did those callers say about you, Mr Robert Smith? Everyone was pretty worried about me and asking whether or not I was actually Leonidas. The nightmare, he says... Continued. In July 2018, the Sydney Morning Herald publishes an article that names Robert Smith and nobody else as one of a small number of soldiers who were the subjects of a secret military inquiry into alleged war crimes. A month later, on the 10th of August, all three newspapers publish yet another article directly referencing Robert Smith. Beneath the bravery of our most decorated soldier is the headline of the Herald article. The cracks in a war hero's facade leads the age. The article raises further allegations, including that Robert Smith ordered the execution of an unarmed Afghan by a junior trooper, that he bashed an unarmed Afghan, 
that he authorised the assault of another unarmed Afghan who was held in custody and posed no threat, and that he engaged in a campaign of bullying against another Australian soldier. Additionally, the article also claims that Robert Smith committed an act of domestic violence against a woman in a Canberra hotel room. All of these allegations are strenuously denied by Robert Smith, and a statement from the former soldier is published at the end of the article, saying as much. His quote reads, The article contains a catalogue of lies, fabrications and misrepresentations. Was there anything that particularly concerned you about the online and print articles, Mr Robert Smith? There wasn't much in them that didn't concern me. I understand that. But was there any aspect that you found of particular concern? Being accused of domestic violence. The fact that they say it's a hero's facade. A picture of me as stone just flaking away with bullet cracks because all I did was serve my country. That's it. One week later, on August 17, 2018, an originating application is filed with the Federal Court of Australia. The statement of claim sets out why and how Ben Robert Smith believes he has been defamed and what effect those articles have had on his life. From 2018 till the current day, my life has changed dramatically. I would say, well, at that point, I should say my life has been ruined. My family life became untenable. My private business fell over. I'm constantly racked with anxiety. And to be able to face people every day takes an amazing amount of effort. And whilst I put on a brave face, because I believe that people deserve that when I'm dealing with them, and because of what people expect from a Victoria Cross recipient, I very much struggle to get out of bed. And I work very hard to maintain that presence in front of people because I think that they deserve it. The Australian public deserve it from a Victoria Cross recipient. That I have had those moments in my life in the last three years that I just didn't think it was worth it. That I have so much respect for the Victoria Cross and what it stands for, for the Australian Defence Force, people that I've worked with. I love my family, my children. And that keeps me going to set the record straight. And that's why I'm here. While this trial has seemingly turned into a public reckoning of the prosecution of Australia's war in Afghanistan... On one hand, the reputation of our defence forces is at stake. What our defence forces are doing in our name overseas is incredibly important to Australia's reputation and to every citizen as a whole. At its core, this case is also about journalism, about the freedom of the press and the power of defamation law in Australia to impede the kind of revelations brought to light by the three newspapers and journalists Chris Masters, Nick McKenzie and David Rowe. And on the other hand, the ability of investigative journalists to be able to tell stories is also at stake because we've seen really credible news organisations put to the task of defending very serious investigative journalism. There lies the tension at the heart of this defamation trial, a tension between a person's right to a public reputation and the necessity of public interest journalism, the ability and need to shine a light on alleged wrongdoings, on potential criminality and the right of the public to know. My name's Leslie Power. Leslie Power is an experienced media lawyer, having worked for the ABC and as general counsel at SBS for 20 years. So all throughout that period, I gave advice, pre-publication advice, post-publication crisis management to content makers of all kinds. Power is now the CEO of the Alliance for Journalists' Freedom. So that's a cause that's very dear to my heart. She says anyone bringing a defamation claim has to prove three things. That the articles were published and read by others. Now that used to be a fairly straightforward proposition if it was shown on the television, broadcast on the radio, in a newspaper, um, that was straightforward. In this era of digital communications, it's much more complex. That the articles identify the person. The ordinary reasonable person will know that that communication was of and concerning them. And that the articles are defamatory. A plaintiff must establish 
that the matter lowered their reputation, that it was damaging to their reputation in the eyes of ordinary, reasonable citizens. It is the imputation or the defamatory meaning with which this case is primarily concerned. There are 14 defamatory imputations being pleaded by Ben Robert Smith. 14 different meanings arising from the newspaper's articles in which Robert Smith believes he was defamed. So what a court does is it looks at a publication as a whole, every single element of the publication, whether it's the headline, every word and paragraph, every grab, you know, every um, interview and spoken word. It considers the material as a whole and it considers what does this material read as a whole, what meaning does it convey about the plaintiff? The imputations refer to accusations of war crimes, of his alleged killings and assaults of unarmed Afghans, bullying specific members of his patrol, and two imputations related to an allegation of domestic violence. And that's really what the imputation is. It's the distillation of what people will understand about the plaintiff when they consume that publication. The meaning of the articles or the imputations can include the ordinary meaning intended by the newspapers when they published or what the reader might infer. Meaning can be distilled through many, many different ways. One of them is the ordinary and natural meaning of the words, but there can be innuendos, there can be sly hints and nudges that convey a meaning that isn't exactly the same as the literal meaning of the words. It's how meaning is conveyed, not just the literal interpretation, but every meaning that can arise. Leslie Power says it is the job of the defence, that is Nicholas Owens and the newspapers he represents, to defend the meaning of each and every claim made in the articles. One of the important things to understand is that the publisher has to defend each and every imputation which the plaintiff establishes has been conveyed. In this case, that means each and every allegation of murder, of bullying and of domestic violence. There are a number of different ways in which they can do this. Truth is the best defence in life and also in defamation. The standard of proof the newspapers need to reach in order to establish truth in this case is on the balance of probabilities. That is, what they say Robert Smith did is more likely than not to be true. On paper, that might seem easier than proving something beyond a reasonable doubt, as would be needed in a criminal trial. But truth can be one of the more difficult standards of proof to meet. Each side has their own version of the truth, and that gets muddied in and amongst conflicting witness testimony. There is exceptionally complex evidence. There are multiple witnesses divided into two camps, giving completely different versions of event. It's not unusual in a defamation case to have, uh, you know, sort of two different versions of events and the court has to decide which version is correct. That's not unusual at all. This makes defending your reporting against accusations of defamation an uphill battle. Despite the allegations from Robert Smith's lawyers, the newspapers maintain these stories were not some feckless sensationalism. They say that over years, Chris Masters, Nick McKenzie and David Rowe slowly and meticulously built their case, painstakingly investigating allegations of war crimes by Australian Special Forces soldiers. Leads were patiently followed, informants repeatedly interviewed in minute detail, information double and triple sourced. But now, the burden of proof before the journalists appears an immense challenge to prove that they told the truth, that they acted in good faith, and that what they wrote was responsible, vital public interest journalism. There's so many more hurdles for the defendant to jump over in terms of adducing evidence or establishing that the defences apply, and particularly when it comes down to that uncertainty of convincing a judge or a jury that your witness is speaking the truth. That makes things challenging. And in this case in the federal court, there is no jury. So the matter of who is telling the truth will be decided by one man and one man alone, 
Justice Anthony Basanko. But in making his decision on whose version of events is most credible, there are some things Justice Basanko won't be able to consider. There have been rumours circulating for years about the alleged actions and culture of the SAS, some of which have been on display in this case. Those rumours were investigated by the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force in a four-year top-secret inquiry. The findings of that secret inquiry are known as the Brereton Report, compiled by Justice Paul Brereton, a judge on the New South Wales Court of Appeal. That report was handed down in 2020, and it found credible evidence Australian Special Forces were responsible for dozens of unlawful killings, the vast majority of which involved prisoners and were deliberately covered up. 39 Afghans were allegedly unlawfully killed in 23 incidents, the report found, either by Australian Special Forces soldiers or at their direction. A total of 25 perpetrators whose identities have not been made public have been found to have been involved, either as principals or accessories. The inquiry found some were still serving in the Australian Defence Force. There are a number of matters which have been referred for criminal investigation. Those investigations are ongoing. The details of that inquiry, what was said, what was found, are off the table for this judgment. One of Robert Smith's lawyers, Arthur Moses, calls it the big vacuum in this case, sucking up information and keeping it hidden from the court and from the public. Because the vast majority of the witness testimony that informed that secret inquiry is not available to either side in this defamation case. Justice Basanko must make his decision based only on the evidence and testimony presented before him. The evidence before Justice Basanko is immense. More than 100 days of court transcripts, over 40 witnesses, binder after binder of legal documents, texts, videos and photos. There are 14 imputations being pleaded by Robert Smith, some of which are more fundamental to the newspaper's case. Over the coming episodes, you will hear detailed evidence from both sides of this defamation trial about some of the most serious allegations made against Ben Robert Smith, including acts of murder and testimony about an act of domestic violence he allegedly perpetrated. These are not the only allegations against Robert Smith that are in dispute, but these are the allegations at the core of this trial. They are allegations Ben Robert Smith denies in their entirety. Next, on Ben Robert Smith versus the media. One of the key allegations in this defamation trial is interrogated. I noticed Ben Robert Smith. He had uh, walked to a position maybe three or four metres away. As I was trying to understand what was happening, he turned around, walked forward and kicked the individual in the chest where Ben Robert Smith is accused of kicking an unarmed Afghan man off a cliff in a village named Darwan. He was rolling down, rolling down until he reached the river. The soldier was looking at him. He was standing there and and looking at him. An allegation he strenuously denies. There was no kick. Okay. Was there a cliff? No, I don't remember seeing a cliff either. And argues it is a falsehood created by jealous comrades. And it's the case, isn't it, that you're jealous of him? Believe me, I'm not jealous of him, OK? Well, Mr Robert Smith received the VC. You didn't, correct? That's correct. Ben Robert Smith versus the media featured Jason Chong as the voice of Ben Robert Smith. Nicholas Owens, SC, was voiced by Colin Smith and Bruce McClintock SC by Dane Carson. This episode was reported by me, Ben Doherty, and Ellen Liebeter. Produced by Miles Herbert and Camilla Hannan, series producer Ellen Liebeter, with production assistance from Alison Chan, Joey Watson, Mel Chun, and Ryan Pemberton. Sound design and mixing by Camilla Hannan with James Milsom. Executive produced by Miles Martignoni and Gabrielle Jackson.
Independent and investigative journalism, like Ben Robert Smith versus the media, takes time and money. The Guardian is free from commercial bias. We're not influenced by billionaire owners, by politicians or by shareholders. And unlike many news organisations, we've not put up a paywall as we believe everybody deserves access to quality journalism at a time when factual, honest reporting matters more than ever. To help us deliver this journalism, the kind of independent journalism the world needs, you can make a contribution to The Guardian. Every contribution, large or small, means we can keep investigating and exploring the critical issues of our time. And it only takes a minute. Just go to theguardian.com forward slash support full story.